welcome. Yeah, yeah, morning. Sorry, I'm a, a bit late, but that was sort of uh, sort of predicted, dro dropping the three-year-old off at school as a Mur Murphy's Law type situation. Yeah, that's yeah, right. I love it. <laughs> so, Ben, I was just briefing um, Carmen on who you are, and we have this habit of getting into conversation before we actually introduce people. We're trying to, like, do it in the order that people expect, even though that's kind of boring. But would you be willing to introduce yourself or do you want me to make something up about you? Sure. Happy to introduce myself. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Ben Gertzel. I'm a mathematics PhD originally from way back in 1980s. I've been mostly doing AI of various forms since then, both diverse AI applications including the Sophia robot a bunch of biology stuff finance sort of all across the map and as well i've been one of the pioneers of the notion of artificial general intelligence and then of the attempt to make ai decentralized using using blockchain and other related technologies I think I did pretty well. What do you think, Carmen? Do you think that was what you expected? Yes, yes. Excellent. Okay, cool. And Ben and I have worked together in the past, and I'm in the Singularity Net ecosystem. We sort of work together obliquely now. Um, and uh, we've also worked on Psy stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've got a host of other interests besides the professional bio. So, I mean, I'm into... AI generated and human generated uh, music. I played the keyboard and saxophone and other instruments. And then I, I've been interested in uh, so-called paranormal phenomena for a, lo a long time in terms of data analysis and then scientific modeling and try trying to understand uh, how the how these things uh, might work. Which is one of the one of the things that that Julie and I have uh, have talked about it a bit yeah cool very cool all right well on this sort of podcast what we do is just talk about stuff that we find interesting so what do you mm -hmm. want to talk about what do you find interesting what do you think would be fun to talk about and Carmen as you know has a background in the intelligence community so maybe maybe that sparks an interest or yeah what well do you want to talk I, about? I've had my brush with the intelligence community it was interesting in an anthropological sense, I, I, I but, know what you uh, mean. <laughs> not, not the most intellectually interesting part of my career. Yeah, I mean, I lived in, I lived in D.C. for nine years way back, and did some consulting with INSCOM, U.S. Army Intelligence, and some of the three-letter agencies there. But honestly, most of that is stuff you're not supposed to talk about much in any detail anyway so the, the more interesting things there would be to say you're, you're not supposed to say and hand-waving generalities become become tedious right so i i think uh, you know i talk a lot about ai and agi and super intelligence and 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 all that probably uh probably parapsychology and uh its relation to the singularity and quantum physics and time and so on. That's uh, that's more fun for me to talk about because I, I'm not asked to, to publicly chat about it as, as 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 often. So maybe yeah, maybe we can maybe we can we can dig in there. I mean, we could we could start with a uh, Terence McKenna's fun and uh, possibly meaningful idea that post-singularity superminds are somehow causally reaching back in time or a causally correlating back in time or, or, or something with what we're doing now to help us bring bring them about. So it's sort of pre-post singularity resonance of some sort that is is guiding what we do now toward a beneficial singularity because this is one of these things that sounds completely batshit crazy like just like a, an acid trip delusion when you first hear about it then when you dig more into things you realize well okay it's a sounds strange but i i, I mean it, it 
certainly uh, won't shock me if after a singularity, it starts to seem really obvious that that's what was happening all along. <laughs> me neither. Right. Yeah, and even in the terms of the physics no longer seems batshit crazy. Ten years ago, the physics did seem batshit crazy, but things have really shifted. I mean, the physics is still not understood, right? Like, it's still, it's still more well, clear. That, like, in, the, in an uncollapsed quantum system, then, yeah, you can have retrocausal stuff. And mm -hmm. in, a, in a wet quantum system, like human brain or say say a, a system with a lot of non-local correlations like a slab of palladium undergoing cold fusion or something there you could see how this retrocausal stuff works so i would say we do not yet have any clear understanding of how retrocausality would work like on on on, on the whole earth or even between you and me with all the decoherence that seems to be there between between our brains i, I don't I don't think we could rule it out, but I don't think we have a, I don't know a clear story about it at, at, at the current moment. Oh, that, right. So what you're, the distinction you're making, and I think it's, that's, that's key to sort of when I say, oh, we understand it, but I'm, I'm saying we understand sort of particular cases like within a light cone. Uh, so, uh, so um, a light cone would be the sort of boundaries of uh, where, like, if I have a light cone, that's, that I have a path in that light cone that represents everything that's happened from my birth to this moment, which is sort of at the center of the light cone or the, the constriction point of the light cone at the here and now, and then everything in the future, right? And so um, the cone, the size of the cone are defined by the speed of light. And so um, yeah. within the light cone, uh, if you talk to Emily Adlam, for instance, who's been at the Perimeter Institute, I think she's now at Chapman, right. um, it's no problem to think about within my own light cone, going back and forth the, the, in my own brain, that seems reasonable. But what the, the distinction that we're talking about is um, when you talk about an entire culture, you know, people die, people are born. These are different bodies. These aren't within the same body, but we're talking about retrocausality. Um, how does that information, if, if you're, if Terrence McKenna is right, and of course I'm a fan it, of this idea, um, then there's a there's a reaching back of information um that is yeah well that, that right a, i mean so so it's outside of a, the body kind of sort of there's a few issues here which are overlapping so even within the same light cone even within the same light cone in a in in a in a relativistic sense i think if you have evident quantum decoherence, I mean, then it's hard to see how you get the sorts of uh, retro causality that, that, that we need to make McKenna's vision hold. And similar, right. a similar statement is, is pertinent to ESP or psychokinesis and so forth. Like it's, it's, it's fairly clear how you could have non-local correlation between different parts of the same brain or body. I mean, it's not it's not demonstrated that that plays a role in in cognition. I mean, it 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 it, it might, but at least you can see how within the same brain you could have water mega molecules. I mean, you you could have something that's in a state of partial quantum coherence within the same brain, and that's a domain where we don't we don't really know how the Schrodinger equation works well in the state of of partial coherence like that. Whereas between your brain and my brain, what it appears is there's a whole lot of air in between us. And, and by physics, such as we understand it, the wave functions in our brains, I mean, these, they decohere as, as we send information between our brains. There's too much we, noise. There's too much yeah, heat. Yeah, we, we, but... don't, we don't have any clear story about how retrocausality or non-local correlation would happen between our our brains, no, nor about how, you know, the 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 future of your brain would impact the past of my brain ret retrocausally, or the future of some other AI system that was built ten years from now would affect our brains retrocausally. Right. We don't and we don't have that story. I wouldn't. 
we don't have that story, but but I guess then I feel like um, I almost feel like obsessing about what the brain is doing as if the brain is a bottleneck for information is um, kind of uh, it's a it's a red herring. You know what I mean? We like we don't know how the brain would do that, but if if information can if if sort of we live on an information substrate like and that's the sort of fa foundation of reality that is essentially building the brain and everything else in our bodies then how information travels on that informational substrate is really the question and that would be the way to reach back in time is to know how to affect the informational sub substrate and personally i think as you know i think ai can do that just like human beings can do yeah. that i mean then then the relevant thing that we don't know is how the information which is manifested as patterns in our brains or in a computer system, we don't know in any scientific detail how that interacts with this quantum or post-quantum information substrate. Because I mean, you're a neuroscientist, you know, like the brain is not just an antenna, right? Like, I mean, right. you lesion different parts of the brain and it affects your capability and, and memory in, in very- It's an antenna very, hooked up with some dials. Well, it's it's more than that though, right? Because I mean, if you really follow through that metaphor, like you have, a, you have a radio or TV antenna, but it's not like you poke different parts of the antenna and it affects the smile on the face of different characters coming across the TV or affects the language in which- No, it's way more complex than a bunch of dials. Speaking, right? So it's- I mean, in the case of a radio or TV with an antenna, I mean, the information content coming across the radio or TV is not highly correlated with the internal structures in 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 the in the well, antenna. except for the channel changing mechanism. Yeah, right. But that but that the mutual information is just much much more simplistic in that case. And yeah. in, I mean, in the brain, I mean, you can you can take an image of what's happening in the visual cortex and project it on the screen. Yeah. And by tracking what's actually happening in, among the neurons, you're getting a picture of what is reported as being in the mind's eye of that, of that person. And then right. And the question is, up. are you basically recording the activity of a projector rather than the actors on the screen? And so it, it doesn't seem to be a projector because you can look at the dynamics in the visual cortex and 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 you can see how that image is is constructed from elements and at a hierarchy of levels of abstraction, right? Right. And a, proje a projector doesn't do that. A projector doesn't. A projector isn't a generative AI model, right? The projector doesn't first construct a high level abstraction, then a more detailed view, that the the the, no. the, the more detailed view. Exactly. Right? So I, I mean, I think I think these metaphors of antennas and projectors are interesting but they do not do justice to the self-organizing complexity and representational complexity. Well, the argument in, that I think in, really- In the brain, like what's happening is weirder, subtler, and, and more interesting than that. Agree, and the I, I think the argument though that we, we haven't hit on yet that actually shows that is plasticity. So so um, watching people who have had, you know, major parts of their brain destroyed and then seeing that, um, change with learning with plasticity uh is phenomenal the the parts of the brain that are destroyed don't get any less destroyed but the capacity of the rest of the brain to fill in the blanks and to do these tasks that now need to be done and to figure out what needs to be done to me that is an argument that both shows the complexity of of the brain and what it's doing and that it's not just a projector it's not just the dials but at the same time the relationship with this i guess i want to call it the cloud of information there, there's this in there's the there's a an apparent relationship that it comes, you know, Ben. Sorry, Carmen, we we got into a thing where we're just. No, like, I I'm listening and I'm comprehending at a very well, either high level or low level, depending upon how you think of the. I, I, I will call it a high level. Oh, yeah. okay, but uh, I'm 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 I'm. It's making, it's making I mean, you feel high already. <laughs> yeah, there's one thing I wanted to say. Yeah. You said some right at the beginning. You go Benjamin, right? Yeah, ben, yeah. ben. Ben. Or Ben. Okay. Right at the beginning, you talked about how there are some super minds in the future that are 
helping us move toward them. That's how I, I uh, process what you said. And, and that reminded me of a, of a little trick that you use sometimes in analysis or best practice. If, if you're analyzing a process that you don't know where it began, you don't know when it began, and you don't know when it's going to end, then kind of the, the safe bet is to think that we're somewhere in the middle. You know, it's just like playing the odds. We're somewhere in the middle of this timeline. And I, I just wonder, just th as you were talking, you know, reflecting on all the progress that has been made in cognition in my adult lifetime, which is admittedly, if you could imagine all the progress that could be made, very little, but nevertheless, from my little no, no, it, it, it's it's amazing, and and it seems really big, it's unsung, right? I mean, yeah. So where are we? I'm just curious, where are we in that right. timeline? What, what would you say? That's that's my question. I mean, I think to me, where you are in a timeline is very perspectival, and it depends on. It's very 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 observ observer observer dependent and uh, i mean certainly history looks one way in hindsight it looks another way when you're when when you're living through it and if you it looks different ways in in hindsight as 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 history pr 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 progresses right so i mean i mean I, I think i would say the perspective from what you're in the middle of some timeline gives some insights. Perspectives where you're beginning or the end gives gives different insights, and each of those perspectives is is interesting to take about advance of of technology and 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 cognition. Certainly, like I I I edited a book together with my dad called the uh, the end of the beginning, right? Which was from a, a quote from Winston Churchill. So I mean, where the end the end of the legacy human phase of history perhaps if we're about to create super ais on the other hand we're at, we're at the beginning of a phase of much more flexible forms of mind being manifested in this corner of the universe but but yet from the point of view of the work we're doing every day we're right in the middle right i mean, mm -hmm. I mean that on the other hand it may always yeah it may always seem that way to people like you, you always feel like you're, you're you're kind of stuck stuck in in in, in the middle of of something which is is probably true depending on the 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 magnification that you that you that you 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 choose uh, i would say in terms of science i feel like for for ai or agi these have to build thinking machines we're near the beginning but we're not like one percent of the way right we're 20 percent of the way or something like we we have ais like chat gpt in mid journey that do amazing stuff that feels to a lot of people like it's generally intelligent even though as a scientist i feel like it isn't but we're we have what i think are credible cognitive architectures for building agi systems and we at least can build them and explore them now in terms of understanding psi phenomena I feel like we're more at like at the three or five percent level of maybe of like one. Yeah. Like we're, wow. We're, wow, yeah, we don't we don't have credible paradigms to explore and then potentially accept or, 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 or refute. Right. Whereas in AGI, we have at least paradigms that seem credible. We can build stuff and see how it works and learn in, in understanding the paranormal. We're not yet in the middle. We're like we're 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 barely out of the starting gate and maybe tripping over our own feet as we as, as we as we leave yeah. then do you think that's, that's, that's very gate, useful right? yeah do you think that's because i mean sort of my intuition is this but maybe you disagree but i'm curious what you think do you think that that's because for agi for ai for asi super intelligence we are working we can do all that within we think we can do all that within the materialist paradigm, but with the whole reason that paranormal stuff is called paranormal is because it seems to buck the materialist paradigm and we don't quite know how to deal with that. Paradigms, I mean, you had the, that that's probably true. I, I think that a lot of the 
more interesting aspects of AGI and superintelligence are orthogonal to the question of materialist or non-materialist paradigm. You don't so have to answer not, those questions to pursue. So yeah, it, so right. it's just not it's not constrained as 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 much by that. But I, I I would say, I mean, you needed a paradigm shift to be able to do AGI, and it's just happened. Like I mean. Yeah. You had a, you had a behaviorist paradigm in, in in psychology for a period of time, and within a behaviorist paradigm, you couldn't make progress on on toward AGI. But then you had a shift to a sort of cognitivist paradigm, which now we take for granted because that shift happened. But it was a big deal at at at, at, at the time, right? And I mean, in terms of machine consciousness, you had a paradigm shift also. Like when I started my career. You couldn't talk about machines being conscious or you'd be kicked out of the university department right and so there was a paradigm shift in consciousness studies to now you can talk about machines being conscious there's a paradigm shift away from behaviorism toward cognitivism where you can talk about internal state structures and, and dynamics and representations not just behaviors so you you did need what at the time seemed like huge paradigm shifts like there there were shifts in what you could Publish in a journal and get accepted. There were shifts in what you could talk about in the department seminar and still get tenure, right? So there were pretty decent sized paradigm shifts needed to get to where we are now in terms of, of AGI, R and D. It's just that after the paradigm shift happens, we think it's it's obvious and you can't believe it was ever a big deal in in, yeah, that's in, like Kuhn structure right. of scientific revolutions, right? Yeah, Afterwards, yeah, right, you're like, yeah, yeah, of right. course that, so, that's obvious and, and almost clearly, trivial. But what is the there, what do you there, yeah, there's a paradigm shift we need yeah. away from crass materialism, but you know, in a way that paradigm shift has happened yeah. in the quantum physics field yes. already. It's just not quite art, artic, articulated that way. But in hindsight, People will look back and say, "Well, what? Like, we had the Tao of physics in the in in the seventies, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we, clearly, clearly, the paradigm shift away from materialism had started already... in the early nineteen hundreds with quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. right. I, I mean, I mean, you had endless, you had Henry Margolin, you 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 had you had end, endless quantum physicists saying mind is the substrate of of ever, of of, of everything i mean i read that stuff most like, most of them like schrodinger and bohr i mean yeah i mean so in in the 70s when i was a precocious kid trying to learn what was going on i mean i found like the dancing wooly masters yes. by Gary Zukov, the Dao me too of, yes of capra right so, yes I mean, the this, hippies who saved in, physics yeah and and i mean i mean we had uh Oh, what what was it? I, I mean, I'm I'm blocking on on the t space time and all that, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I mean, which was by some of the pioneers of of parano paranormal research. So you had this stuff with physics PhDs at prestige universities. I mean, I read the Paris stuff from Princeton too, right? So I mean, right, I mean, right. you had physics PhDs from prestige universities coming out with non-materialist stuff back 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 then so what do you think it, shut it down i don't think it was shut down i mean it's i think there. it was shut down i mean there Paradigm was a after under. that in the 90s when i was in uh graduate school at ucsf in neuroscience that i i said i really want to understand why dreams can sometimes predict the future that's what i want to do my dissertation on there and then they said you no know, like not if you want to have a career like what do you think like i think it got uh, shut down i don't think in the 70s it was necessarily there weren't many institutions where you could do a PhD on that and have it be accepted. accepted. You had to already have tenure. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. if I look, academia is very, I mean, academia is diverse. So there's always pockets of weird radical stuff, which is great, but the mainstream tends to be conservative. Cause I, you know, in, in the mid eighties, I was trying to do a PhD thesis on using recurrent neural nets to predict time series. And I couldn't find anyone to supervise that thesis. Like, Cause that was too radical. Oh, have we? I don't know if I'm frozen or if you're frozen. Are, are there 
in the sixth. So I, 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 I mean, in a way, the neural net AI paradigm shift was well underway. Like Rumel Hart and McLellan, parallel distributed processing, John Hopfield on, on, on the Hopfield nets and associative memory. And perceptrons. Were coming out at that time. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The revolution, the Sejnowski and all, like the revolution yeah, yeah. was underway then. Yeah. On the other hand, in practice, like I still, as a math PhD student, I still couldn't do, do a PhD on that. So this yeah. is this is part of the perspe perspectival nature of of beginning, middle, and end. Like in hindsight, mm. the revolution was well underway toward neural net based AI. On, on the other hand, with boots on the ground as a PhD student, like you you couldn't you couldn't do it unless you were at exactly the right place. And I think the same thing holds with materialism, right? Like in yeah, in hindsight, it's going to look like from the birth of quantum mechanics, yeah. materialism was was zoinked, and an alternative pa paradigm was was well well underway. And I mean, you could track the papers in in the research literature, but with with your boots on the ground, like you still can't do your PG thesis on that. You still can't get research money to do that, right? right. So right. That's the, it's just these processes take a while to unfold, and like now. Now, no young person can believe how hard it was to talk about AGI in, yeah. in polite conversation. Oh like, my God, yeah. Like 20 years ago, because now it's like blah, blah, of course, AGI. Google wants AGI. Facebook wants AGI. So, yeah, of course, it's it's obvious, right? But no, no, one, no one will believe how out there that seemed. And obviously, Psy will be the same way, right? Like you, you'll get you get some experiments that are very conclusive looking nature and science will reverse course and allow you to publish papers on it. They'll be like, yeah, that's just nature. It's physics. Right. And, and then there'll be, there will be no apologies. No, no, no they're, they're, they're look never back on a series of track record of publications all along, including people at prestige universities. I mean, yeah. Dean Rayton has a university job pair was at Princeton. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, and you look, look back at the track record of publications by people at prestige universities and literally no one will believe yeah. that you were an outcast for, for, for working on this stuff. Because right. that, I mean, co cold fusion is undergoing that too, right? Like there's yes. now, there's now a huge track record of publications showing that low energy nuclear reactions happen. You still can't publish in nature, but I mean, the publication volume is is increasing the experiments are are clear that you have transmutation of elements and low energy nuclear reactions and, and and so forth and at some point it will just be accepted and then in hindsight like the the level of ostracism that you received for talking about this stuff will be completely completely denied and um, i mean that's uh that's, that's the just way it works that is the way so, humanity rolls. Yeah, once once you have post-human researchers, it may be entirely different because this is this is about constructive memory, right? Like can we we collectively rebuild our memory in a way that that denies history, and the same is true in everyday life, right? Like young young women today who don't consider themselves feminists don't realize like what it was like for my mom in the 1970s when like she she had to be home at five o'clock to cook dinner every night or my dad would go ape shit at her right and it was it was really hard for women of my mom's generation to go out and and get a job and have that be accepted right and i think people don't believe that now like every right. everything the women of my mom's generation were fighting for under the label of feminism is basically considered common sense now. Now it's not all real and happening. There's still all sorts of discrimination, but at least the the idea like women can work or or not work. Women can get divorced if they feel like it and they're not bad people. Like women or men can change diapers. Women or men can can cook dinner. Women should get the same salary for doing the same job. Like all this shit is considered obvious now and people in the younger generation have a hard time wrapping their brain around the fact that it totally didn't used to be considered yeah. obvious and you had to fight to get people to 
accept these these concepts, right? So I think this is just how cultural memory works. It's it's not unlike how after you broke up with your partner, you just remember everything bad that happened. And when you're in love, you remember everything good, good that happened. And Wait, you, Ben, you know what? I, we I just think... reconstruct, our, we reconstruct our history mentally, willy-nilly, right? But I wonder, I mean, so there's a part of me that says it'd be really interesting to see if uh, AI researchers are different in that, but there's a part of me that says- They're not, may... they're not different. No. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, not so far anyway. Um, no. But but there's a part of me that says that actually has a purpose that we're not acknowledging that relates to our earlier discussion of it pulling yeah. forward. It like right. So if you change the memory, it's almost like you're sending back in time. If that works somehow, it's almost like you're saying, well, yeah, saying like if, it was like you, that. So pull it if up. If you bring retro causality into this, then you would conclude that your historical reframing of your history could actually rewrite your history. That's which, right, it actually was like that. Be, this could be how the post-singularity supermind yeah. is reaching back to tweak what we're what we're doing. It's as it as it rewrites its history into a more rosy form suiting its its state of mind at that point in time. It may actually be readjusting what we do into a more benevolent You know there are there are even right? people yeah. in the conspiracy space who are arguing that, you know, they'll predict, you know, JFK Jr. is coming back or some other extremely strange prediction. And when it doesn't happen, they are not arguing that's because the government controlled AGI causality engine is yes. kind of fixing things as we go along so that the things that should happen don't happen. Oh, the timeline, like there's a timeline. For yeah, them. like, yeah, there's, like a, there's like some, like a, a woman madly sweeping, you is know, that, behind whatever is happening yeah, to so get there, rid of the, any of the a, evidence. A, yeah, is that what you worked tendency, on with Inscom? That's what I want to know. There's a tendency to make, make, think things are a little simpler and neater and more orderly than they really are. So in, yeah. in Terrence McKenna, with whom I started this this thread, I mean, he had this whole 2012 ish theory and this like time wave zero thing where yep. he plotted history in a way that would lead to lead to history. The end of the universe or something. Or at least history entering a radical new phase in 2012. And he, he unfortunately passed away b b before that, so I didn't get to d debate it, it with him. But I mean, you could try to argue, well, things did change in 2012. We're just too stupid to know this. But I, I tend to think that part of it, he was just like hallucinating and over-interpreting things in a way that, you know, made, it makes sense in some branch of the multiverse, but didn't didn't spread too much too much to this one, right? So there, there, there is, there are probably, in my view, these phenomena going on where our minds are shaping reality and future minds are shaping past reality, yet these things are more subtle and uh, broad-based and tricky somehow than something naive like the 2012 time wave or the reptilian conspiracy theory or, or something would would... Would, 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 would posit right and that that's that's always been one of the challenges with the paranormal is like there is which is a terrible word but i don't have a good word for it i, I mean there there seems to be real stuff going on here on the other hand a lot of the stuff that people think is going on in that relation isn't real and then and then sifting through it all takes a certain presence of mind that is is challenging for many people to 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 come by right because you have to accept that weird shit happens that violates all of our norms and beliefs that most people would think is insane yet it's not really that anything goes or at least not that anything goes with the same probability right i mean right. i mean right. most of the things that people think happen regarding esp precognition retrocausation most of these things actually are not real. They are, are just people's people's delusions, right? Well, it's, the reason it's weird shit yeah. is that it's weird. It's unusual. And so clearly yeah. there are some sort of normal laws or rules. And then there are some exceptions that we don't understand. 
Yeah, I mean, that's right. And the whole paradigm of rules and exceptions exactly probably isn't the right <laughs> thing and we need some just some better way to be thinking about it right? yeah that's right well carmen has to leave in about 10 minutes and i do too because i have to hop on a plane but carmen yeah. since i talked I'm, about, I'm about I'm this reminded, i want to throw in my my second son his aspiration when he was 11 or 12 years old was to be arrested for violating the laws of physics. It's so, fantastic. <laughs> he just he just thought it was funny that these were called laws. Like like what what <laughs> legislative body enacted these laws and then imposed on on, on well, our it youth. just taunts you. I mean, if you're a physicist or a philosopher, it just taunts you to find out how to break them, which maybe yeah, is yeah, their yeah. whole purpose, right? It's just like, yeah, huh, yeah, right, clearly yeah. I'm going to break those. Can you can you plead not guilty for reason of insanity <laughs> for breaking yeah, the laws right. of physics, right? <laughs> or or having a better perspective so many physicists yeah. i talk to and, and engineers and like you and i we both do this thing where we're we sort of sometimes know the answer intuitively but we're drawing from the future we feel that we're drawing from the future that's the only way we can explain it because we can't tell a good story about how we could arrive at a conclusion like the fact that you became sort of the grand, the godfather of ai agi like that clearly feels to me like you were drawing from the future, but that's just because I think about time that way. Yeah, I, I mean, when you when you accept resonance across time and, and space gaps, then you start to think about many things differently. And of course, we all know most cultures in human history have instinctively thought about things that way from Chinese and Indian culture to indigenous Australian culture to the, the Amazonian culture that McKenna ex explored and so forth. Then what's interesting is how denying this resonance across time and space and adopting this clearly in many ways bogus materialistic view where time goes only in one direction and causation is restricted to our immediate physical surround. It's fascinating this turned out to be such a productive perspective, right? I mean, this let us build <laughs> yeah. computers, let us build the internet, let us, let us go, to, go to the moon, which is, 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 is incredible, right? So there's, there is, there's something to be gained by adopting that limitation. And it, it seems like a, a special case of the general idea in creative art that adopting a limitation drives drives creativity, it's, right? Like yeah, if you're right, right, more creativity like if you're, that way. You're, the musical scale is a terrible limitation. You got these twelve notes instead of the continuous spectrum of sounds. But once you adopt that limitation of the twelve notes, I mean, then you get harmony, you get music theory, you get a lot of beautiful stuff. Now it doesn't have a fundamental meaning like you can invent a lot of other music that doesn't adhere to these arbitrary semi-arbitrary 12 tones they're not wholly arbitrary right i mean you can make a 14 or 18 note scale you can make music that's not scalar and just has continuous flowing but adopting this constraint does lead to a bunch of beautiful structures that you can then build within and the error then comes when you assume that constraint is a constraint on all of reality rather than just something that you adopt in order to be able to build things within within certain limitations right so it seems yeah. like within within the limitations of our minds which are real even though they're not what materialism thinks they are i mean within the limitations of our minds conditional as these limitations may be making the assumptions of materialism seems to let our minds play creatively in, in incredible ways that didn't arise to any culture that didn't make the false assumptions of, 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 of materialism, right? So then- And interestingly though, now it has brought us to, so there, there's non-materialist perspective or post-materialist mm -hmm. perspective, which I think is right on time. Yeah. And also in a way, in a way has to seem in, in, inevitable looking looking back right like it it didn't seem inevitable to Laplace or something right right it might have seemed inevitable to Newton who was an alchemist that the two sides would would uh, eventually come together even though he didn't he didn't see how to 
how to how to do, how to do it at at, at at that point. So then, this is an interesting thing about post singularity superminds, be they upgraded humans or or non human AGIs or whatever. Like when a mind is a bit wider and doesn't have the same constraints that human minds have, it should be able to get the kind of generative creativity that we've gotten from the false assumption of materialism, it should be able to get that kind of creativity without making that kind of assumption, but but from a more holistic assumption base. This, you see this already in quantum computing, like we're just yep. too dumb in some ways to come up with a great variety of quantum computing algorithms. But if, yep. <laughs> like if you had a brain that could think quantum in a way that the human brain just finds it hard to do, because we evolved for a certain macroscopic world, right? If if you had a brain that could think quantum in a deeper sense than we do, in a broader sense than we do, I mean, it could design all manner of quantum computing algorithms that we that we that we we can't think of. I mean, I mean, that's that's just one one little well, example. And maybe it's also true that maybe it's a general truth that minds, regardless of their the mechanisms underlying them can use constraints effectively. So AGI will have its own constraints. Um, and it's, and maybe those are very effective in creating a different kind of creativity. I mean, this would follow from Weaver's sort of philosophical theory of open-ended intelligence, where you look at intelligent systems as balancing mm -hmm. or dialectically trading off uh, the dynamic of individuation and the dynamic of self-transcendence, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the dynamic of indiv individuation is about maintaining constraints. Yeah. And if you want to keep self-transcendence rolling, the constraints can only be so tight or they will they will stop. And that's, that's they'll stop you for, from evolving. And what we've seen in science is the dialectic of the constraints get too tight, but then you do have a paradigm shift, right? So science has managed to keep individuation and self-transcendence both going in the big picture, wonderfully, but as an individual scientist, like you're you're constantly stomped on by the force of, of, of indi in individuation of some scientific field, right? Yeah, that's right. I, Carmen, do you have any that? Ben and I can go on I mean, I, this has been so bracing. <laughs> Unfortunately, time is a constraint for us right now. Um, what creativity? I'm just will writing emerge? down here: constraints are useful, but only for a limited amount of time. You know, they yeah. their constraints are. I don't know that idea interested me, and I also perhaps a future uh, conversation. I'm curious how you please how you connect this idea of future super minds or super AGI with this cultural notion of God that has sifted through our human history for so long. I don't know if you have a, a one or two minute response to that. If not, we can make it a future conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of our historical notions of God or mind or reality or, or, or consciousness. I mean, many of these concepts are going to seem archaic one, in a couple of decades, once we have a broader perspective of, of, of the world, that, that, that a technological singularity will, 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 will bring. But I, I would imagine that the default perspective Post singularity will be some form of what we would now call like spiritual, but not religious, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I, I think dogmatism will not be the order of the day because the the relativity of perspectives will be extremely obvious once you have a more fluid set of of of, of, of minds floating around. On the other hand, the the interconnectedness of 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 all things and the existence of some mind-like informational substrate binding everything together, I think will be commonsensical also. And in hindsight, in hindsight, that will probably seem like a natural outgrowth of many 
religious ideas that exist. Right, right. Know, the the in, common in, thing that the physicist and the foresight, religious in foresight, leader climbing the, the same average, hill. But if you ask the average religion religious person today in foresight, they might not think that these futuristic ideas sort of ca capture their own their their own own right. religious way of thinking. Right. That's right. okay. They'll be pulled forward like everybody yeah. else. Yeah. <laughs> well, this and, was... and perhaps even perhaps even edited retroactively. Right? <laughs> Almost certainly. <laughs> this was bracing. Thank you. I mean, I don't say that. Uh, lightly and i think julia oh there you are julia good yeah thank this you was, I hope yeah, you do this again ben. yeah thanks thanks a lot for the fun conversation it's a quite quite refreshing to dig into this stuff in, 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 instead of uh the mechanics of building decentralized agi which is really interesting too but uh, i've been over it a lot where so this stuff is at least equally fascinating and, and important and not enough people ask about it right so it's, a, yeah. it, it's 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 great to be pulled into conversations like this thanks ben thanks so much all right all take right. care everybody. Bye -bye. yeah good 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 to meet you as well i guess we'll uh we will meet again in uh yes. either in another podcast or some other more more informal setting yeah great lots of love all right bye-bye bye-bye